All right. So I'm gonna ask the next speaker on stage, Janmar from uh, Wati. So give him a, a warm round of applause. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jalmar. I'm the CEO of a company called Wadi. We are really, I think, compared to Nordnet, much more of a very, very tech-oriented startup company. Really, like the entire business is uh, built around machine learning. Um, just to bring up two examples. So when, if you can go to view uh, the full screen mode, thank you. When the Stockholm.ai group was started, they made a list of all the companies in Europe, do, or in Stockholm, doing serious AI stuff, just to get a sense of who should be in this community, and they ranked those by how sophisticated their AI was. And they put us as the number one company, which was very cool. We were not involved with that. We also were one of the six companies selected by Wired this year, as sort of the hottest startups around. So we've focused pretty much all of our efforts on the machine learning side, and I think we've gotten a lot of results um, to prove for it. But before I start, I'm really curious about who's in the audience. So just raise of hands if you are working with machine learning today. It's like maybe, okay, maybe like 25%. Uh, raise your hand if you have taken the Coursera course on machine learning. Okay, so roughly the same. So raise your hand if you finished, completed the course. Okay, so that's like... Glorify. <laughs> um, okay, great. And raise your hand if you want to work with machine learning. Okay, so that's the other 24%. Okay, awesome. Um, so we never set out to be a machine learning company. We didn't think it would be a really cool thing to have an AI business. We started with a problem that we thought was really exciting, uh, which is the problem that I think is the major problem for humanity over the next couple of decades, which is the transition to renewable production and consumption of energy. So as it turns out, the major source of CO2 emissions in the world is not cars, it's not trucks, it's not anything on the road. Two times bigger in terms of emission than anything on the road is what's going on in our buildings and in our households, right? And the reason for this, everyone in this room knows, because you've, you all get an energy bill and you all ignore it, right? So everyone, like no one understands their energy bill, no one cares about it. When people buy a car, they look at mileage. They, they think about sort of, oh, how much is this going to cost me? With our homes and buildings, we don't care. And therefore, we behave uh, in a very, let's say, non-optimal way, both in terms of sort of our spending, but also in terms of the effect we're having on the environment. So we really set out and thought about, okay, is there some way that we could make this easy enough to understand and make better choices about your home um, then that would be a really meaningful company to build. And so that's what we set out to do. And we thought that a few things would be really important to get this right. Obviously, it needs to be very, very simple because the main challenge today is that it's so extremely uh, boring and like people spend an average of 10 seconds or something like that every year thinking about their electricity bills. We thought it was critical that it was real time, so not just a piece of paper, but something that you could actually interact with and that could tell you something interesting like when you needed it. And uh, thirdly, we thought we need to bring the insights to the end customer rather than having the end customer sort of trying to figure out what to do with the information. So we built a product that delivers on these core things. Of like, and it turned out it had to be based entirely on machine learning. And at the time, so we started the company in 2013. When I hired our CTO, I literally went on LinkedIn and I typed in machine learning and I found about 10 people, right? So it was not like no one cared about machine learning when we started. We were like, okay, but we need to somehow automatically make sense of energy data. How the hell can we do that? Well, you need algorithms. Well, okay, that's now called machine learning. Okay, we need someone who knows that. So that was how the company was started. So the product we've built is uh, a really simple device. It looks like this, that you can install in the fuse box of your home. And this device reads your energy consumption at a very, very high rate, so several thousand times per second. Whenever something in your home is started, so let's say you're plugging in uh, your stove or your microwave or whatever you're doing, there's a surge of power, right? 
And this search of power is detected by our device. It notices, OK, something just changed in this home. It captures this change, and it pushes it, pushes it to our cloud platform, where we have algorithms that have been trained on tens of thousands <coughs> of millions of examples of, let's say, microwave. So when this particular pattern is sent to, the, to our cloud platform, we have an algorithm that's saying, OK, that looks very familiar. That looks just like these other million microwaves I've seen. I bet you there's a microwave running in this home right now. And then we push to the end customer a very simple overview. Your microwave is running in your home right now. Right? So we've taken the energy consumption of your home, that's just an aggregate of everything you're doing, and we're able to, in real time, break it down into its specific components. And um, with no extra hardware. So I mean, the traditional view of like, how do we get IoT? How do we get this sort of smart system? Is we replace everything with something that has, is connected to Wi-Fi, basically. And that hasn't really taken off because it's super expensive and it's super clunky. So we replaced all of that and went for pure sort of data analytic solutions instead, just understanding the data a lot better and then trying to explain it to the end customer in a better way. <coughs> so this part, so we started the company in 2013. And we were like, okay, so this doesn't look too hard. Like, you could read the papers. We're like, let's work really hard for six to eight months, and we'll have something in the market. And three and a half years later, we shipped our product this summer. Hey. <laughs> so it turned out to be a really long and tough road to deliver the promise of this technology. What's really cool is that there are other companies who have tried to do this. They have been way bigger, way better funded. And we have been in, in uh, completely independent benchmarks where companies set up these tests and they try all the different people who are trying to do this kind of appliance detection. And then they evaluate and they publish how good were the different companies. So we've been part of three of these benchmarks and Moti has been the number one company in every one of those benchmarks. So that's really cool, right? We're a small Swedish company and we actually ended up shipping the best technology in the world, literally, for this problem. And the reason, like, <laughs> the, the secret sauce of the company was really like, we made a bet to be a data-driven company very early on. And that's not some like, oh, we believe in data. That, what that means is we took pre almost half of our funding and we hired a bunch of people who only did data collection for us. And then we did that for three years. So we have now, we think, the biggest data set in the world on appliance energy consumption data. Then we can apply the latest like state-of-the-art deep neural networks, whatever you want. I actually don't know myself uh, because I'm not allowed near the, like, the complicated stuff. <laughs> but we have the data, that's the point. And because we made a bet on the data, we made the right technology bet, we worked our ass off, we were able to beat our competitors, even though they had much, uh, much bigger scales and a lot more money. So that's really cool, I think. So the product itself. You know, it's a really easy way to keep track of what's happening in your home. You install this, you can forget about it, and then we track all your different appliances. As I mentioned, we find the unique fingerprint, so like the unique identifier of the different appliances, and we learn to associate those with the appropriate uh, appliance. The more users we have, the more fingerprints we get, the smarter algorithms become. So right now we're getting thousands of user-generated fingerprints every month. So we have gone from manually collecting data to now getting all of our users helping us build up the data set. And that's what creates like the real moat towards competitors. So it's not just enough to have the data we've collected ourselves now. You have to also have our user base in order to have the same quality of data. So you might ask, so like energy savings, you know, that's our mid, like that's where we started the company, that's great. But most end consumers, they don't really care that much about their energy bill. Like, if you ask someone on the street, do you want the lower bill? Yes. Do you want to pay for it? No. Okay, so that's the that's reality. So not only did we have to, uh, like, figure out the technology, we have to figure out value propositions that are actually mainstream enough that we can scale this with, with consumers. So the product today, uh, most of our customers really respond to the use cases that are connected to keeping your home safe and not having to worry about what's going on at home. So it turns out that the most, like the biggest threat to your home, like it's not the burglary, you know, it's not the meteor or the earthquake, it's the appliances you have in your home. And today, 99.9% .9 of homes have absolutely no monitoring. 
you lock the door and you leave and you hope everything's fine when you get back. Right? Maybe you have an IoT sensor that sends you an alert, like your house is on fire. You know? We can actually detect what's going wrong before your house turns on fire to begin with. So, so that's actually a really use case, like it's not directly related to energy saving, but it has real value uh, for end customers. Then we have other things, like things going on in your home when you're not there. Maybe it won't burn your house down, but it turns out that things like appliances breaking and malfunctioning that are not related to fire, like your fridge freezer, um, leaving the door open or the compressor stops working, is one of the major causes of water damages. Your food is ruined and it's also just you know, extremely annoying. And then finally, we have um, energy saving. So once you start understanding your energy costs, the best studies on this indicate that you can save roughly between 17 and 18 percent on, on your energy bill. So if you live in Stockholm, you can buy this product today. It's 39 sec per month. It's a pure subscription service. You don't pay for the hardware. You don't pay for the installation. And you will see for yourself, like there's a lot of technology just to make something work in a very simple way. So we've tried to be, it's very easy when you talk about these algorithms to think a lot about, you know, oh, it's big data and we're doing all these complex things. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is, you know, how happy you can make an end customer in real life, right? So we try to stay very connected with the people who could actually derive some benefit from this. And it's a longer story, but let's just say like energy household consumption data has a huge role to play in the future of our energy system with solar and wind and balancing the system. And we are gonna need this data to make the grid work right. But we're never gonna have that data, like enough of it, unless the end customer think this is interesting enough for them to use and start to adopt. So we try to st uh, keep a really serious focus on the end customer. We are hiring for our machine learning team. So we'd love to talk to you. If you work at what, do you raise your hand? Okay, so talk to these people. Uh, you're not yet, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> can definitely talk with us later. Yeah, so that's it for me. I'm happy to take some questions. Yes, how did you train the original data before you start uh, letting on paying it to customers? How did you receive the data for uh, finding out if it's a refrigerator or a yeah, sure. machine? So I, to take the long story first, the way you were supposed to do it when we started was to train hidden Markov models in a way that was described in uh, the literature. So we tried to do that first. We had very limited data, and we tried to make these uh, hidden Markov models. And our CTO uh, said to me one time, like, Dalmar, it's not that like it's not working. Like none of the stuff we've built is working. It's worse than that. <laughs> right? Which is really like, how can it be worse? that nothing is working, that's like, uh -huh. okay, that's interesting. But what he meant was like, we don't even have enough ground truth data to understand if this is like a reliable result or not. So it's like, even if these things were working, which I don't think they are, we need to have the ground truth data to evaluate them in a big data set. So what we did was uh, we hired a bunch of people, they went out, they went into homes, and they installed plugs on every single appliance in these homes, together with an electrician, like of the real dirty work, right? And they were there for six weeks. We took them out. We went to a new home. We put all the things in. How did you find these people? I mean, we called them. We just put up with something. In yeah, your we home. called them. We said, we said hi. We're just a bunch of like scrummy like KTH uh, students. We're doing a project. We would love like uh, to um, have some of your energy data like for a thing. Like, would that be cool with you? No. <laughs> uh, then we added a financial incentive. So first, we were like, come on, it's good for the world, and that didn't work. I worked with family and friends, but then quickly. Then we added a financial incentive, and then it worked okay. So, but it, it cost a lot of money to collect yeah. ground, like high quality yeah. ground truth data. But as I said, what's cool is once you have it, that's like an enormous advantage or any other company wants to do this. Is it a topic in your company or in your project, the morals around collecting this data, like people fearing that you will know what they're doing at every moment? Yeah, so the topic of privacy always comes up. And it's a tough one for IoT, I think. So I have an Alexa at home. Alexa is the most popular IoT product in the world. It's a microphone in your living room. <laughs> like, that's like the most uh, privacy. And that's not even talking about the microphone you always have in your pocket. But like, like, you invite Amazon into your living room, literally. So I think we don't 
it's always a topic, and it, basically there are so tough regulations on this on the EU level that we have to deal with it. But on the consumer side, it's not clear that, like, if you deliver a good product, that this is actually one of the big concerns of uh, people. But as I said, like, the legal stuff on the EU level is so harsh that, yeah. like... It may come. That it may, absolutely, it may come. But if you use your toaster, it's not that sensitive information. So I think, like, on, on the whole, there are a lot of companies in the home with cameras and stuff that have way more sensitive information than we do. But, uh, yeah, uh, what was the uh, machine learning history of your project? Uh, for example, you say that 2013, that uh, you realized that the machine learning is the, is the way. And, uh, but uh, this uh, deep neural network, artificial intelligence, <coughs> like starting to take off, uh, uh, like in 2014, like uh, after 2015, uh, Google, uh, when they announced uh, this uh, TensorFlow uh, for the public, uh, and then the Keras and then this platform. And then, the, I mean, did you use, uh, from the beginning, did you start uh, working on the deep learning in 2013, or you work on the machine learning first and then just move on to deep learning in 2015 or later? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think like gradually we've tried to try the things that seems to work the best. I think we were kind of lucky or skillful to have a pretty good idea based on some of like Hinton's early like uh, handwriting sequential work. Mm -hmm. But like uh, this seems to be the right kind of approach. Yeah. So I think like our tech team did a great job identifying that early. But now I think things are changing so fast. So we're, we combine a bunch of different methods. We switch them up all the time. And actually like to, to make a, like a, a work for a startup pitch. So I, uh, a few weeks ago I was um, at another AI event and Shit Step was there. And um, <clears throat> the person in charge of their AI lab had a slide that said, like, and if you're a really unserious company, you work with these completely immature technologies. And it was like TensorFlow, Docker, it's like all the things that people are using. So like, we would never build our products on this. Okay. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's like, uh, the, one of the benefits of being a startup is to, like, when there's a new release, like you get your hands dirty, yeah. you know, by the end of that week, you're up and running, uh, testing it half the time. So, so I think we've been fairly quick to adopt. Uh, so your AI system is not based on TensorFlow? I couldn't say. And if you want to know the details, we have two of our, uh, like from the machine learning team down there, they, they can tell you much better than I can. Um, so I can imagine that the energy consumption and the electric prices switch differently depending on in what market you are in. Like, for instance, if you're in the US, it looks differently from if you're in Europe or in England. So they have to, like, uh, re, uh, recollect all the data for every market that you're entering, uh, or can you actually use your models for the different markets? Uh, well, what's like the the general concept of how we've always tried to work is like you run your algorithms. If you get poor performance, you need to collect more of some data set, right? So we can uh, sort of verify this has poor performance, and then we can go out and specifically get the data for that. I think the U.S. is the country, <coughs> excuse me, where they sort of do their own thing with the whole electricity grid there, and we have our biggest competitor there as well. So right now we're focused in Europe, and probably um, China and Asia is going to be the next market we focus, and their things look a lot uh, more similar. But the short answer is, like, if we've noticed that we need the data, we need to go out and collect it. What we'd love to do is actually to set up a collaboration with the appliance manufacturers and, like, for them to give us the data, they have it in their labs. So far, we haven't been successful in convincing them that the, it would be a good deal, idea for them to know what customers have their products and what problems they're experiencing. But no <coughs> luck so far. <coughs> Right, so, um, like the principle is, we have a, <coughs> a model that is trying to detect something, let's say a fruit freezer, and we have collected in hundreds and hundreds of homes how the fruit freezer looks in lots of different situations, right? And so we feed to the algorithm the goal of identifying when the fridge freezer is turned on and off based on all of these observations, 
right? And a perfect result is whenever it's turned on, we detect that right, and whenever it is turned off, we detect that right. Mm -hmm. So if we do those things right, we have a perfect understanding of when the fridge freezer is running. Right? So that's the goal of the algorithms. And we feed all these examples, and as I mentioned, like if we get really poor performance, let's say you live in Finland, then you have a sauna, and for some reason, like the model has never seen a sauna, maybe it mixes up the sauna and the fridge freezer, then we need to go into Finland and collect lots of homes with the saunas so that we can get examples of what the fridge freezer will look like in a home like that. Yeah, so when a so if you buy our, like if you go to our website, buy the products, 39 francs per month, if you have it in your home, you turn on your kettle, within half a second, you will see in, in our app, my kettle is on right now. When you turn it off, within half a second, it will say it's no longer on. Right? So whenever an appliance is turned on or off, our model is detected and you can see it. Yes, so we are like, I started with it like 20%. The, like, the, to do anything, like just the stakes of even getting started, is you need to have the, the data, the relevant data, right? And it's taken us three and a half years to build the technology so that we can get the data. But then we have all the work ahead of us on once we have the data, how do we now realize that into these savings? And that comes from recommendations, that comes from using this data to help energy companies better manage their, how they operate in the grid. Um, and as I said, like with electric cars and solar and wind, they have a nightmare in front of them in the next 10 years. So we need to help them manage that in a better way. There's enormous amount of money there. Uh, but as I said, like the, the stakes to even be playing in the game is to have good data. So that's what we focus on in the first step. And now we're in a sort of go-to-market step where we're working with these big energy companies on getting the, the rollout so that we have not just the technology but the data sort of streaming in real time in a large scale. And then we can start building on top of that services um, that may, has an impact. With the challenges of the energy market you just mentioned, like with renewable energies being a, a big challenge in general for the, for the system, have, have you seen any interest in the city, for example, of recommending installing that, getting Stockholm Bustad to install these things in their buildings, for example? I would love to say yes. <laughs> no, so... Um, but, but the question would rather be, could you perhaps comment on why not? Yeah. I mean, it is from... It, it seems like a logical choice. It's something that the, the country would benefit from. <laughs> Uh, and having a big player like a city, yeah. not to say the government, but the city, uh, they would benefit yeah. really from So one of the things that is fun and really tough with the energy market is it's extremely politicized. So like the politicians call a lot of the shots yes. and the incentives are really spread out. So let's say that all of us use 20% like less energy, that would be a good thing for society. Like hands down, we would save money, we would create a lot of benefit. But for your grid company, that might be a very bad thing because they've made investments. So you have all these like skewed incentives. And when it comes to like the cities, etc., you know, we demand of our politicians that they only buy the cheapest possible service uh, that goes through these really tough trials, right? And that's maybe that makes sense, but if you're a startup, that's not really going to work, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's very tough to get through any type of purchasing decision uh, with. Um, with a city or anything like that. In other European countries, it's, it's different. So I know companies who have done really well getting a whole city online on, on some product in, in Italy. In other, in other countries, I've seen it. I, in, in, <clears throat> I've seen it, especially in Italy and Spain, I've seen it work. Oh. I've never really seen it work in Sweden, which. Uh, that's interesting. I would have thought the, the opposite. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you can, uh, that makes you think, right? Like, huh, how did they get that deal? Like, yeah. oh. okay. <laughs> no, no, All right. So I think I'm going to have to round this up here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to approach the guys from Wati uh, afterwards. Uh, and I'd like to thank Yalmar very much for joining us here today. It's a very cool product and service that you have. And uh, I know for sure I'm going to get one of your boxes, and I think everyone else should as well. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, guys.